Okay, seven o'clock, we can start. Good evening, everyone. Uh, great to see everyone here. Um, I'm Sarah Stolfa um, from BPAC. Um, I'm excited that Nina Berman is um, gonna share her work with us tonight. Um, we are lucky to have her work uh, in our gallery in 2015 with the Marcella Shale Project. Um, so it's great to work again with each other. Um, just a few announcements. Um, <clears throat> we have a new series of webinars that start tomorrow um, at noon um, entitled um, Finding Focus um, in, time, in Times of Trauma and in Times of Crisis, sorry. Um, so the first one is tomorrow and it's from 12 to 1.30. There's still space, so please feel free to um, sign up. Um, I'll put the link to the event in the chat when I'm done. And then also we've opened our artisan residency program. Um, so they, uh, that application is also on our website. I'll throw that in the chat as well. Um, it includes a month long residency to use the lab, uh, use PPC and work with the team in any capacity that's gonna help uh, an artist set, uh, reach their goals. And this year um, there is no application fee because um, we wanna be able to help artists and um, during this, um, this crisis. Uh, so check it out. Um, I don't think there's anything else. So Lori, do you wanna take it from here? I sure do, thank you. Thank you. I'm um, very, very pleased and honored Nina is um, going to be sharing her work tonight. Nina's been uh, an inspiration and a leader um, to me in my, throughout my entire career. Um, so it's, it's, it's very wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Nina. I'm gonna read her long um, bio. Oh because no, shorten it. <laughs> No, the reason is, is uh, because you've done so much and you've created so much work that has had, uh, uh, I think, a very um, uh, powerful impact in our world. And so I want to read the long into it. It's not that long. She thinks long is long, but it's not that long. Here we go. Nina Berman is a documentary photographer, filmmaker, author, and educator. Her wide ranging work looks at American politics, militarism, environmental contamination and post-violence trauma. Her photographs and videos have been exhibited at more than 100 venues from the security walls of the Satari refugee camp to the Whitney Museum of American Art. Is the author of Purple Hearts Back from Iraq, 2004, Portraits and Inter Interviews with Wounded American Veterans, Homeland, 2008, A Look at the Militarization in Post-September 11, America, and recently, an autobiography of Miss Wish, 2017, a story told with a survivor of sexual violence, which was shortlisted for both the Aperture and the Arles Book Prizes. Additional fellowships, awards, and grants include the New York Foundation for the Arts, the World Press Photo Foundation, Pictures of the Year International, the Open Society Foundation, the Documentary Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, and the Aftermath Projects. She is a member of the Photography and Film Collective, NUR, Images and images and a professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism where she directs the photography program. She lives in her hometown of New York. Thank you, Nina. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for showing up tonight. I am, um, when thinking about what I was gonna do here, you know, I, I was trying to figure out what body of work should I show? And then I thought, well, you know, I've long kind of wrestled with pictures and text together. So this is the first time I'm kind of talking about them like this. And so I'm really eager to hear your input in the Q&A and how you as image makers, artists, writers, curators, whoever's out there um, also think about image and text. Um, I did start as a writer, so maybe that's why text has always been important to me. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna, I guess just jump right in. I'm gonna share my screen, yeah? Um, okay. Whoa. Do you, see, do you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, my first book was a rush job and um, it started in 2003 and when I started taking, uh, doing portraits on a Hasselblad camera um, and, and interviews with uh, wounded soldiers who'd recently come back from the Iraq war. And um, 
a publisher at that time, Gigi Gianuzzi, who used to run an imprint called Trolley Books, we had been talking about another book, Homeland, and he, he saw these pictures and he said, Nina, Nina, we, we should do a book about this now. So we kicked this book out in about eight months. And I have to say that um, the design could have been better. And when I look at now, I, I look at a lot of mistakes. But the text was very important and became more and more important as I would exhibit the work. So it's basically, um, it starts with, a, with an introduction as many um, photo books do. And I, I um, can you see these words? It's hard to say just when the word hero went bankrupt. So just for some context, it, it was controversial to show pictures of wounded soldiers in 2003. Um, the United States did not want any visible evidence that somehow the war in Iraq was not going well. And the image of a wounded soldier became very loaded in a sense where on the one hand, they wanted to show the sacrifice of American troops, but on the other hand, they didn't want to show, you know, um, intense pain and suffering amongst the American military, which was supposed to be, you know, the victorious power here. Um, and at the time, in some ways, like we're seeing, you know, we saw today, well, in, in these times with the pandemic, this word hero is, you know, a, a big word in the United States. And I, I've come to almost see this word hero as, as being used when you, when you want to congratulate someone, but you don't want to actually talk about um, uh, the pain and suffering that they went through. And so um, I started with an intro by writer Verlin Klinkenberg, Board, who had uh, written an intro to a Mother Jones piece we did. So the book kind of starts out, I'm, I was hoping to sort of dispel any ideas that this was going to be um, a conventional look at um, wounded soldiers. So it's um, 20 portraits uh, done, you know, in the course of eight months. And it's basically, you know, portrait and then text. And so, but the text doesn't really have anything to do with the Iraq war, very little to do with the Iraq war. And so in my conversations with the soldiers, and this is where I feel like the text was unusual in this book, is, you know, they would say things like this. I've always thought about death way before I joined the military, just growing up in Chicago and living out here in this world. I had a friend when I was six years old, his name was Charles and he got killed. He was shot in the head. I think it was a stray bullet. My oldest sister was killed by a stray bullet. I was just a few months old. My father was killed when I was seven. He was being robbed. So death has always been around. So when you see a text like this, do you then look at this picture differently? You know, and so that's kind of how the text kind of, you know, the text informed the pictures, but maybe not in a way that you that you expected will form a book called Purple Hearts you know, which is the medal you get when you've been wounded by an enemy. Um, so for me, a lot of the, the reporting really and interviewing was how to draw things out and how to listen closely to the things that they wanted to tell me. Um, I did have some series of questions that I would ask each soldier. And one of the things I was very interested in, in learning was how they were recruited. Um, for many people may not know, and certainly the people here that maybe are not, um, you know, living in the United States, is that the U.S. is a volunteer military, and the way people are joined is through recruitment, mainly in high schools. So there's a whole apparatus um, designed to take young people into the military and acclimate them to military culture and also to convince them that this is an excellent career move. Um, some people call our volunteer army really an economic draft in the sense that people who have no other job prospects uh, go into the military. But this particular soldier, Adam Zaremba, told me this. I joined in high school, the recruiter called the house. He was actually looking for my brother and he happened to get me. I think it was because I didn't want to do homework for a while and then I don't know, he get to wear a cool uniform just went on from there. I still don't even understand a lot about the army. And so, um, again, you look at the picture, you have a certain response. Um, 
And as opposed to a caption, which may just say something like Adam Zaremba photographed at the Fort Riley, Kansas base, you know, or museum, um, to see this, then how do you read this picture? So th that, that, this idea of a kind of like photograph and text as one plus one kind of makes three in a way, like it makes something else, is what was interesting for me in this book um, regarding the text. So this is Adam Zaremba. You can't see it in the picture, but he lost his leg. Um, he was stationed at Fort Riley in Kansas where they have a museum to the cavalry and I photographed him there. Um, and so what I tried to do with each, not just to make a unique picture from with each individual, but to pull out in their story something that was also unique that maybe had more to do with American culture and militarism and the broader social political context around the war as opposed to simply, you know, wounded in say Talapar, Iraq or wounded by an IED, right? So um, Randall um, talked a lot about um, trying to bring freedom and democracy to the Iraqi people, but he also focused a lot about making uh, how the Iraqis themselves were scared. And this contradiction of trying, of being, you know, your mission was to bring freedom and democracy, but in the process you terrify people. And so there was never any kind of recognition that somehow these two things might be contradictory, but there was just an expression of, you know, uh, well, what he says, we were trying to help them and they didn't want us there at all, right? So, um, And I avoided asking straight on political questions. Like I never asked them, um, you know, are you pro-war, are you against war, something like that. These are often not questions that elicit interesting responses. Um, it was more kind of, um, what did you expect there? And did it match your expectations of what you thought war was? Did you ever think you were gonna get wounded? Um, you know, um, how do people talk to you or look at you since you've gotten home? But Robert Acosta was the one one soldier who actually um, felt that he had been deeply lied to. And so the only kind of anti-war statement, if there is one in words um, that the soldiers say comes from him. And um, this is what he said. I mean, like all the reasons you went to war, it just seems like they're not legit enough for people to lose their lives for and for me to lose my hand and use my leg and for my buddies to lose their limbs. Like I just had a big conversation with my buddy the other day and like, we wanna know, I feel like we deserve to know. And I, I walked a very fine line with this project because I did not wanna be tagged one way or the other as pro-war or anti-war. I wanted to be able to talk to all audiences, something that almost seems impossible to do in, in today's environment. But this was um, very important for me um, in terms of the outreach of this work. I also did not want to have my own opinions sort of mapped onto the soldier's own views because I felt that would be exploitive of who they are. So that was another reason to have the text as first person. Um, are there any questions? I can't really see if there's comments when I screen share. So, Not or should I just yet. plow on? Hmm? Yeah, we can keep going. But if there's anybody that wants to ask a question, please chime in. Okay, I'm just gonna then keep on going. Um, so, I did a Homeland book from 2001 to 2008. So I was working on these two books simultaneously. Um, the Homeland book is a totally different approach to text. It, um, there is, um, at the end, um, you know, kind of commentary uh, by Michael Shaw, who does something called Reading the Pictures. I wrote a little thing at the end, but there's, um, I created a somewhat fictional persona as a narrator. And um, I did this because I think I was just so 
unable to really gather my thoughts around all the things that I had seen. And some of it which just struck me as so unbelievable that the only way I felt like I could convey accurately the, the fan, fantastical mind bubble that we were in during that time was to create a character based on people I had seen, stories I had read, things people had told me, and my own sort of mixture of paranoia and astonishment um, in post 9-11 America. Um, I start off with, you know, a quote from one of my favorite writers, Franz Kafka. And um, I think photographers like to find, you know, these quotes, which novelists sometimes do, where they find some little thing that in the beginning that sort of sums up what they're trying to say. And even when I read this, this little fable <clears throat> about the mouse and the cat, I still can't really describe what it's about, except, you know, some creature, whether this creature is me or this creature is the United States, you know, locked in a world where they know it's doomed to the end and can't possibly find their way out. Um, so that's how the book begins. Um, and then it goes to this picture. And then it's, um, it's in three parts. So the, the three parts are prepare, believe, and defend. And each of these parts is um, matched to um, a page in the book and, you know, with a vertical <laughs> picture and then a, um, a page in the book. And I, I, I sort of in, inhabit this creature, right? So um, beginning with I'm learning how to be safe, I ordered my anti-nuke pills and stuff for my child and a radiation monitor, which I put in my keychain. Some of these things I actually did myself, okay? So one of the, the reasons why I started this book is because living in Manhattan, I could not decipher on a daily basis when I should be freaking out and nervous, you know, that there might be a, two other buildings bombed, you know, or when it's actually totally fine and I'm just being manipulated by the massive propaganda machine. And so how you, you know, swim your way through that muck is, is challenging. I, I found it really challenging in that time. It was one, one of my ways through it was to do this work. Um, I have a go kit stashed in a white pail, just like the one used by 9-11 rescue heroes during those dark days when they dug through dirt and bones. bones. Um, and so it goes on to there, from there, one of the um, words that was frequently used and I would see as an acronym was GWAT. I don't know if people know what GWAT is, but it's the acronym from Global War on Terror. Debbie Cornwell probably knows very well what GWAT is. Um, but, you know, the the kind of absurdity of this acronym. And um, yeah, so so prepare, I went off and looked at how people were preparing either on a state level where you had what I like to call kind of state sponsored performance art um, or individuals just, you know, um, doing what they, you know, what keeps me going is knowing that even an ordinary person like myself can contribute to the success of the Guat. And that was very much the, the ethos of the country and how Americans were manipulated into supporting a war against Iraq, even though Iraq had nothing to do with September 11th. So um, yeah, so the text kind of sets you up for pictures that you see um, afterwards with only just tiny little captions on the side these are senior citizens hired by um, the city of Delray Beach, paid for by a, a government grant to patrol their neighborhoods. You know, they'd look at tennis courts, they'd pick up tennis balls, look and see if they were a bomb, they'd go into people's offices. Um, and it's like, it's unclear what is the staging and what is the, the real world. So, for those who lived through those days, who remember um, before we went to war against Iraq, there was visions planted in the brains of Americans of you know a mushroom cloud, 
right? That Saddam and a mushroom cloud were gonna kind of descend. And so there was actually a massive distribution of potassium iodide pills, which um, one can take um, to protect your thyroid from nuclear radiation. So this is um, North Carolina. And then you had, you know, preparation for war. Um, this is this, this place, um, Fort Polk in Louisiana, where people, uh, troops go to get like uh, cultural training before they are deployed. And it's become a whole economy where the locals get more, much more than the minimum wage to dress up, whether it's Iraqis, although these Iraqis look more like Saudis. Um, and yeah, so that, that's basically was the prepare. Then there's the believe section, and this opens up a section around the intersection of militarism and Christianity. And um, I inhabited the a kind of an alter ego of someone who, you know, spends all of their time in mega churches and everything they read, all their friends, everything around them is based through this church. I would also mention some things in the text, some events that I wish I had photographed, but I never got to. Like when I say, I feel it on God and Country Sunday when members of our military marched down the aisle. So this actually did happen. I didn't see it, but this happened somewhere else. And I was thinking if I ever put this book online, I will hyperlink this text, which could be actually a really fun project. Um, but I did spend, you know, about a year photographing megachurches. Um, this one was in Ohio, but it got struck by lightning and it's no longer there. Um, anyone watch the Duggar family? Well, I, I went to photograph them early on before they became TV stars. You know, this is the family that is, you know, on TV to see how many more children they can produce. <laughs> you know, um, he was running for, was it, I believe Senator. Um, and then this was at a mega church in Colorado called New Life Church. This is the Royal Rangers, which is a Christian version of the Boy Scouts that actually has chapters in lots of mega churches. Um, and then the defend and, and this, you know, each of these sections is about five, 600 words. I just like gave you little snippets um, that I hope will, transport you back to the sense of the country during that time. So defend says, my president says that somewhere in the world to this very minute, a terrorist is planning an attack on me. And George Bush did say that. Um, I think of this and feel scared and then I feel angry. Um, and yeah, so I spent a lot of time working on these texts, sending them to some friends to see if my tone was insane, um, believable, you know, to flippant. Um, I don't know if I succeeded. Um, anyway, I spoke for this chapter, I photographed militarized police. So these are SWAT police, local police, um, armed like military police, something that we see very often now. Um, also SWAT members with a, uh, little sticker on the car that says United States terrorist hunting permit. And um, this was a Marine recruiting exercise in Bronx, New York, where children were face painted, handed weapons, and um, basically just told to play. Um, and this is human target practice at Fort Bragg. So the, the game goes like, this is a real person and the kids got the gun with a laser and if the laser hits the soldier, then the soldier will drop dead like he's dropped dead and um, then the kid wins. Um, and then I kind of end it, you know, I was reading some Don DeLillo at the time and I ended it with um, this little passage that I, at the time I thought, wow, Nina, you've really gone over the top. No one's gonna read this book. And not many people did when it came out. It didn't really get much attention in the US. In fact, I don't think, yeah, I don't think people really got it or understood what I was doing. But um, 
yeah, it's almost like a manifesto that this alter ego of mine is stating or like a morning prayer almost. And at the end, she says, I will offer my children to this end. And you know, that's really how I felt photographing things like this, you know, military recruiting exercises that I started getting very angry at the parents because I was, you know, in my head, I was angry at the parents because I was had photographed all these wounded vets, so many of them for so many years, you know, some of them like so close to death or close to suicide. And then I think, but these parents, they just want to give up their kids. Like, why are they so willing to give up their kids? And um, yeah, it's a question I, I guess a lot of people, you know, ask around wartime, why do parents give up their children? Um, okay, um, on to uh, something, yes. There are questions that I think before we go on to Ms. Wish, are you going, is that next? Cause I want to like, I want- No, no, to Ms. Wish next. Okay, so let's do some, let's do some questions real quick. What is your opinion of untitled images or, or this is sort of like, yeah. What is your opinion of untitled images or images without text? Yeah, so I think that, and I'm gonna get to that soon. I think some images untitled, you know, they force the viewer to make up their own story, right? And that can be fantastic because you're not then directing the viewer towards a certain narrative. It's like, here's the picture and you viewer, you provide the narrative. And that can be wonderful. For me, since my work is so grounded in the social, in like the politics of the moment, I feel at some point I need to say like what it really is. And so in Homeland, the captions are really tiny on the side and they're not very extensive. So you get a kind of like the rhythm of the whole fantasy of it without getting bogged down in a lot of text. Um, but in Purple Hearts, I feel as though you really do need text with those pictures. I mean, the, the pictures are a very empathetic look and then you read the text and sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know. Wow, this is a little more complicated than just, you know, I feel so sorry for these, you know, very fragile looking people. Yeah. Um, another question, what did you say to the wounded soldiers to convince them to participate? Since you are not a wounded soldier, how did you appeal to them without them feeling exploited? Well, first of all, I just want to be really straight. Getting your picture taken is not necessarily an act of exploitation. So, you know, I see it as primarily an act of affirmation. I didn't have to convince them. Most I would say all but two people that I contacted were really glad to participate because their stories were not being told. In fact, they had been X'd out of the narrative. Once they were released from hospital, they were nobodies. No one cared about them. No one talked about them. And so all I said to, to them was, hi, I'm a, you know, I would, I found them by searching online at the local, in local newspapers through Google searches words like bomb, brain, hero, soldier, military, Iraq. And, um, and the local newspapers would write about like, you know, oh, the football hero or the this and that, right? Coming home. And then I would cold call them or cold call someone listed in, this, in the article, say, hi, I'm a photographer in New York City. I'm doing a portrait project on Purple Hearts recipients. Can I come out and photograph and interview you? And only like with the, the first person in Long Island turned me down and I thought that was gonna be the pattern, but it was not the pattern at all. And so I don't think, I think it was to my benefit that I was not a wounded soldier or a soldier or a military because I came from it with a lot of ignorance and ignorance can be a good thing, you know, because, because it makes you, it can make you really listen, you know? Like I thought when I was first starting this that they were gonna be really, really mad at George Bush, but they were not. But I did not impose my, you know, uh, my viewpoint on them at all. In fact, so I, I, hope, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, next one, there's a few, so we're gonna do this. Uh, Good. What comes first, the text questions or the images? Does the image influence the text or do the answers influence the image? 
in Purple Hearts, I photograph, I interviewed them before I photographed them. And so, um, because I don't know how to just walk into a room and tell someone to go and sit someplace. And I have to really have a conversation first before I feel comfortable and confident that I can actually make a decent picture. Um, but there wasn't really, the only time in Purple Hearts where their text and where they told me influenced the a picture was sometimes location, right? So uh, sometimes they'd, they'd say, like I asked one soldier, you know, where did you play after, you know, he had told me he'd grown up there. And I said, where did you play? Like, did you play in the woods? Can we go up there? That kind of thing. But the, their actual like stories didn't influence my, my pictures. Um, in the making of the Miss Wish book, most definitely the text and the pictures are intertwined. In fact, it's not even really a photo book. It's a, it's a totally different construction. Um, next question is from Debbie. What has the reaction been to these projects among members of the military as far as you know? So I sent the Purple Hearts book to all of the um, veterans and the ones that wrote me back said they liked it. One person, I had done a story before the book was published and I mentioned something he said and he said that would get him in trouble. So I took it out. Um, the, the military military um, has never given me any, you know, communicate with me in any official capacity. Although there was one, there was one soldier I tried to photograph who was in military hospital. And when I landed, I was told I couldn't. Um, but other than that, yeah, I haven't had any reaction from the military. Um, I just want to say I moved back to the United States the year that book was came out and um, I found it profound, uh, profoundly moving, but also I felt it provided a touchstone, a place for people to start talking about the wounded soldiers. And I don't know um, what, how you, what, what kind of reaction you received on the ground, because I know this is a traveling exhibit as well. Um, but uh, I feel like it had an amazing impact on, our, on people's ability to sort of start to talk about this stuff. Um, we were still not photographing the coffins, I think. Right. right. So yeah. can you just talk a little bit about what that was like on the ground for you. Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, I made postcards when the book came out and I just put them around in my neighborhood. And then I went to the post office one day and I saw a woman with a whole stack of the postcards sending them to her friends. And then I, I printed up some pictures and I had them in the basements of Riverside Church, which is near where I live. And I remember watching a young man coming in. He must have been like 22 or 23. And he looked at a picture and he goes, oh shit, that's not real. And, um, and so, they were shocking these pictures at the time. What was also shocking is that um, now it may seem much more common, but then it really wasn't, is that the American ideal of a wounded soldier is someone who's being helped, right? Not someone who's alone and, and weak and, and in pain, which my pictures look like they are in pain and many times they were in physical pain. Um, so I think, you know, it's not a very masculine view, okay? So if you look at the back of that time, you know, a bit after me when people, other people started photographing wounded soldiers, they, they did a different kind of thing or, or the media was very much focused on, you know, look at the new prosthetics and look at the battlefield medicine and look at all the great doctors going to, you know, put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Right. And um, my pictures, they've already been put back together, you know, and been sent home. They don't look so good and they're lonely and they feel lost. And I think in the end that that became much more the narrative as, as people saw how the VA was not helping as it needed to and all the suicides that we see today. Um, and then Robert Acosta, who I mentioned, me and him went on a, um, a tour together to high schools and universities. And, okay. Um, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Should I move to Miss Wish or should I answer some more questions? There's two more questions. Okay. 
And we should just do this because I, I know Miss Wish is a different kind of space. How are you able to gain access permission to photograph people, places, mega churches, militarized police, SWAT members without having your photographic intentions questioned? Do you go in as a freelance documentary photographer or what do you do or say? Well, I think that my questions are often intentions and I think that there's also, I go in a different, uh, as in different roles at different times. So the mega churches, I had pitched a story about churches town Right, like I had an idea after um, the 2004 election that mega churches were the new American town, and so um, you know, if you want to go to the gym, you go to the gym at your mega church. If you want a Starbucks, you can go at the mega church. If you want a job, you ask the pastor. You know, and and so the church is town. And so I pitched this story to German Geo magazine and uh, worked with a writer at the time who. I really loved working with. And so that's how I was able to get into those churches as a German geo photographer with this writer. Um, but the SWAT thing, they turned me down several times. And then at the very last minute, and I had no assignment, I had no publication, just a freelancer. Very last minute, they let me in. And I would think that they would really like the pictures I took in a way. You know, I don't think that they would have any trouble with it. They're, you know, I don't see, I see these pictures as, as, um, yeah, I, I don't see them as um, disrespectful. I just see them as kind of showing it the way it was. I'm gonna keep plowing through. <laughs> Who paid for the travel to go photograph the wounded soldiers? Do you have, did you have funding for that project? Uh, I started it as a self-funded project and um, the first two soldiers were in Pennsylvania. So I just got in my car and their, their location determined act, actually, you know, I, um, <laughs> that I could go there and, and not, you know, have a plane ticket or anything like that. Um, later on, Time Magazine gave me some really important travel money that pushed me through. Um, they never really published the work. Um, and then I was able to continue the, um, the travel based on European photo sales because European journalists really wanted to do this story but they couldn't get access. So um, I would hook up with some European writers and you know help them through. And that's what funded it because it was a lot of air travel. I, I wanted to make sure I, I went all over the country to photograph this and not just have it like in one or two states. Now the next two comments are more about the, the, the content of this lecture um, and this talk. I mean, um, hi Nina, I understand that the reasons why you did not want to put yourself into the work that makes up Purple Hearts and I see the effort you put to that end, but I was wondering if that is rendered moot since the brief text accompanying each portrait was in the end selected, curated by you from all the things the subject of the portrait may or could have said. and it. And so it therefore becomes a bit of your interpretation of them, question mark. I do think your work is very powerful, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, well, whenever you edit somebody, you know, it's your, it's your interpretation, but it's also you trying to make some sense of their individual story and how that fits with this group of 20, right? So if I started to get multiple soldiers saying the same thing, I would remove that part from one soldier right in the edit so that it wasn't so redundant um but the little bit i'm showing you today is is a snippet from what's in the book so um you know the interviews would go on from anywhere from a half an hour to a couple of hours and in the transcription yeah there's editing but um one of the things that what I meant to to say, which which was really no easy feat at the time, is that you you couldn't just buy my pictures of these soldiers then, right? Like I didn't put put them in my archive or database and say, here are random journalists doing a random story about a wounded vet. Here, take this one. That was not possible. I kept a tight lock on those because it would have been disastrous one it would have been you know completely unfair and unethical to them 
if a picture of one of my soldiers was the lead picture in an editorial against the war. Like, that would have blown my reputation. It would have destroyed my integrity and it would have made them feel really used. So if you wanted to publish my work at the time, you had to publish it with the text or I had to work with the writer who then interviewed the soldiers themselves. And this was the first time I ever did this with any of my work. And it was the best decision I've ever made. And something that is not easy for to always do with your work, but something that I've really like kind of uh, been much more committed to. And I hope that answered your question. Yes, I think um, I, I just want to ask one more because it, it goes back to the Kafka quote. As with the Kafka quote, do you read a lot to inform the mood or approach in your pictures? What did you read for the photo books you are presenting? Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, that'd be a whole nother great lecture, wouldn't it? <laughs> Could do with lots of photographers. Um, I read a uh, this brilliant book by Catherine Lutz, who's a professor at Brown called, and I'm gonna space out the name. Oh no, it's, um, it's about cities and military bases around the country. Um, I read that. I'm trying to think what else I read at the time. It's been a while. I looked at some Jenny Holzer work for sure. Um, Purple Hearts I read, you know, um, um, kind of every single fiction book about wounded soldiers and nonfiction book. And so, yeah, I was trying to, to get in the story, right? Um, for Miss Wish, I just read all of the material that we created. I didn't read anything else. I'm going to hold the last question for the end. Um, Ricky, okay. I'll give you. <laughs> Should I keep going then? Let's, okay. let's move, yeah. So, this, you know, this book was a, like a, a huge departure, but some, a work that I've been living since 1990 and took me 25, 26, seven years to, to make it into something for public consumption with my friend, um, Kim Stevens, who is Miss Wish. Um, and so for those who may not be familiar with this book, it's, I met Kim in London in 1990 when she went by the name Kathy and she was living on the street and we met randomly and, you know, 30 years later, we are still very much intertwined and um, she lives here in New York and she's someone who had a very violent um, upbringing and was running for her life during much of her life and kept diaries of it and kept medical records to try and prove the things that had happened to her so that maybe one day she would be able to achieve justice. And I um, tried to help her along that way. And we became very close friends. And um, for many, many years, I didn't take any pictures of her. And our, our friendship was about something completely separate from photography. Um, but I did hold on to all of her stuff so that at some point, if she was in a safe space, she could have it. And so I was her archivist in a way. And, um, and then some years ago, we got together and um, we thought, because she had always wanted to do a book about her very insane life story. And um, kind of inspired by the growth of photo books and the expanded nature of what documentary means, I felt like I might be able to do this. And I got a, a residency for people working on sexual violence. And I put together all of our materials, including her um, diaries. And the book, it doesn't open with a picture. It opens with text. So it opens with this, which was her yes, no book, which she drew. And she would flip through the, she, she had a dream where she would flip through the pages and, you know, if she was supposed to do one thing or another, the book would tell her yes or no. Um, and so this book was designed by Tom van der Heiden, a Dutch designer. It took us over two years and about 15 versions. Uh, Tone came to New York, met Kim a couple times, and 
the arrangement of you know pictures and text is super complicated. Um, so you have this picture. There's no caption. You don't know the year, right? And then you see this, and so this was a note she wrote to me. So in some ways, you know, we have this, and then we have this because of the greens. But it's also, if you read the text, it's about the moon, and this looks like it's done in moonlight. So, you know, and then you'd go to this, which is a sort of text that you kind of can decipher, but now you're in London. So, you know, the text kind of bridges you between these worlds of, you know, back in 1990, flashbacks, um, then diaries. So, the, the, you know, one of the issues was, do I speak in the book? Like, should I speak at all? Should I have any place where I write stuff? So like, you know, here I see Kim, you know, in, you know, in London sleeping, or, you know, here me and Kim went to Central Park and um, she talked about trying to hang herself there. Like, should I say those things? And if I say them, where would they go? And how would the reader know it's me saying them and not her saying them? So, at some, at, so we decided I would just be removed completely, which was a liberation for, you know, and, and I just wrote in a more traditional way at the very end of the book. Um, so there were there were documents and there were we would pair some documents with some drawings. So the documents became also a voice, like almost another narrator that provided some kind of distant expert almost uh, account. The patient listed eight events that that constitute the flashbacks, three of which were described to me, right? So this is a doctor's emergency room report. Um, so we would cut that up and put it next to the pictures. But this, for instance, we went through this back and forth and back and forth. So this is how it appears on in the book page. Picture, no text, nothing on the left. It's a phone booth. She used to go to this phone booth and call for help. So this was the text we wanted. I was warned never to tell anyone, but I figured out I could call the Samaritan. Some lady at the other end of the line would comfort me. I spent hours in that phone booth. I would crouch down so no one could see me and the wire only just reached. So at first, I really wanted that next to the picture. I'm thinking, oh, that's good, right? We have this picture and then we have the text. And the designer was adamant. No, don't put it next to it. Let the viewer kind of sit and just look with the picture and live with the picture. And then you put it after. So all of these decisions, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, you just try it out and you see how the rhythm works. And it was, you know, me, Tone and Kim like going through this, but I do remember that this was a big, a big debate <laughs> about whether the text should be next to it, on the page after it, on the page before it, um, you know, because a lot is handwritten, then the text becomes a kind of visual object in and of itself, right? So with its own aesthetic value, it's not just the content of the words, but actually becomes, you know, an image. Um, and then one of the things that, that, was difficult in the storyline is that it takes place in London and then it takes place in New York and how do we move from England to New York and so the designer used these um, blackouts so we go from here to the New York subway and then there's a page like this which I thought was you know when he came up with this I was like holy shit man this guy is a total genius that he could see all of these redactions and then the windows, and then see this as some kind of timeline, right? And that's how we were able to um, solve the, the puzzle of how do we move from England to New York through these lines of redaction. So um, yeah, 
Tom Vanderheiden is just incredible. Um, another thing, so the text, um, you know, wh what do you want the reader to know? Like, what did I, what did I want her to know, the reader to know about Kim? And, and so she would go on the subway seeking money. And then she talks about how she would sometimes meet people that were nice to her. And then there's this picture because she's actually really nice to other people and to animals. And so it's not like, oh, she's hustling for money, but the story is really a love story. You know, it's really, that's what it is. It's a love story. And so the text kind of bridges this picture to this picture. Um, and I'm almost done. Um, again, so there's this, and then there's one of her drawings. So this is a drawing, she's in the stroller and she's remembering a moment when her mother walked away. And then she says, I'm hoping that my mom, my biological mom was just a prostitute. My dad was a sailor and she had me and left me in the hospital. I don't care if she did sell me, blah, blah, blah. If I could meet my mother, all I would wanna say is that I love her. I don't think she knows it. And then you go to this picture. And so again, the words like, transported you, the, the words continued a certain theme about love and loneliness and family, even if they were describing something that didn't seem, that wasn't connected in a linear way with the picture or a factual way with the picture. I don't know if I'm describing that right. Anyway, and then, you know, in the book, there's this whole theme of going from the analog to the digital world and how we communicated and, you know, first in handwriting and then um, <clears throat> text. So, so this is one of Kim's texts and that's it. Um, well, that was a whirlwind. That was amazing. <laughs> that was powerful. It looks, um, it looks, it's, it felt really emotional for you to, to talk about this. Um, how, how many pages and how, how many pages are in this book? I want to get a sense of its size. Okay, so it's um it also has a couple different kinds of paper. Um, but the book is um I believe it's over 300 pages. Okay. Oh no, it's 265. And was Kathy part of like the, the arguments like with was she part of this? Kim was a photo editor. Yeah. Kim was involved in the whole process. Yeah. Okay. But um, the subject, the, audit, the the woman whose book this is reflects. Oh, this is Kim. So she has two names. Okay. So Miss Wish was, was the name that she went by in England. Okay. And it's what you see in the documents. And then her name is Kim Stevens. Okay. So I refer to her as Kim because I've known her for... 27 years is Kim. <laughs> so um, there are some questions. Um, uh, I'm going to just start with Ricky's because it takes um, takes you, I can think general. Do you think being a woman made any difference at all in your work to this point? I don't know. Because it's, I've only been a woman, so I don't know. But I think with Kim, it's like, you know, so we were friends with the soldiers. I think maybe because I wasn't interested in, I felt like weirdly motherly to them, you know? And so I think I didn't have the whole trope of masculinity, you know, that is so much about the military. And um, maybe they felt like they didn't have to put on that face for me. And maybe if it was a man, they would have felt like they would have had to put that face on. But I don't know. We never had like like a, a conversation about that. And in Homeland, I think a woman or a man, anybody could have done that work. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and thank you, Oliver, for for um, for helping me out with the Catherine Lutz book. For those of you who don't know, Catherine Lutz is genius, and she also wrote an early critique of National Geographic, which is just mind blowing. She wrote it in the 80s and it's really worth reading. Look it up. So there's a comment, there, a question from John. To the extent that a collection of photographs lean on text more elaborate than short titles, the photography can be categorized as illustration. 
Some have used the term to denigrate photography compared to fine art. Are you comfortable with people describing some of your work as illustration? Oh, I think that some of my photographs are illustrations. I don't know if the pictures I'm showing here today are, but I think some like landscapes I've photographed, I, I've been photographing military contamination. I think, yeah, that, that they need text. Um, maybe that makes me somehow not a pure photographer, but I don't really care because I'm, I'm about how to convey stories and ideas and concepts and feelings and whether it's done through a photo alone or a photo with something addition, it's fine for me. I don't, you know, I guess the fine art world is different rules and, and but that's not really anything that's ever um, interested me too much to be honest. How do you treat feedback when you're still in process? Well, I felt totally lost with the Miss Wish material. So you, we did need three people to put this book together. And it was a beautiful experience. I, um, I actually, um, I'm not someone who is like terribly confident so much. And so I feel, very much that I can learn from other people's suggestions. At some point I may say, no, no, no. I know I really need it to be this way. And I hope, pe hope people will listen, but I'm pretty open as, as long, you know, I don't feel like I have things mastered. So when you feel that way, it's easier <laughs> to collaborate with people. <laughs> That's true. Can you see this last one? Can you tell us a little about the shift in Miss Wish from a more traditional role as a photographer, writer, to archivist, curator, friend, advocate, and whether, whether that experience has informed your work or approach to photography since then? Um, huh. Well, I felt that she was someone that really needed some help and she certainly didn't need pictures. And I felt that pretty soon on. And so, um, yeah, so I tried to be someone that could help. And then I started taking pictures of her again because I needed to do it for me, not for the public. I needed to have pictures of her because I thought she was gonna die. And I needed that like you would of anybody that you care about. And then it also became something that was kind of fun for us, like something that we did together. And, um, but I don't have the, the reservoir of, uh, I could never do something like this Miss Wish book again. I just don't have it in me. Um, and I think that um, even when I was photographing the soldiers, you know, I didn't do like what Eugene Richards did when he hung out for many days and with them. This was a portrait project. So you're kind of in and you're out, right? So you're there a day, maybe two days. And part of that was, I didn't want to get so involved. And um, yeah. We do have time for one more question. Um, what do you make of the quote by James Agee from Let Us Now Praise Famous Men? If I could do it, I'd do no writing at all here. It would be photographs. The rest would be fragments of cloth, bits of cotton, cotton lumps of earth, records of speech, pieces of wood and iron, files of odors, plates of food and of excrement. Well, I don't know. It doesn't apply to me at all. I mean, in my work, I, I think words are like essential. I actually find them informative. And, you know, I don't know why someone would say that, especially a writer, um, maybe. So I, I don't feel that way. I, I get that there are people that just want the, the pure photograph or, or just like, you know, the the fragrance of a place or the texture of a place, but I actually like to hear what people have to say. Um, uh, 
great. I'm, I'm really curious about um, what you're working on now and if it's going to continue to lead to, I mean, are you going to, is there a book coming? Um, so I'm, um, I'm about to go on a film project, video project, video sound project. I'm less interested in photography these days in still photography, maybe because I am interested in words and sounds. Um, but um, I'm bored with my own photography. So um, yeah, so I don't know. There's, there's one body of work, which I've been thinking maybe I could pull into a book, but it's not really driving me. And for any of you out there who've done books, you know, you know this is not your ticket to success, right? You, you, you do a book because you feel like it's something you really need to do and, and um, you just find any which way you can to make it happen. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the, con the questions continue. Oh dear. Okay. That was crazy. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, we should close. I just want to thank you very, very much, Nina. It was a great, great conversation. I learned a lot. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, uh, Sarah, do you want to say anything? Yeah, just thanks uh, for being here. Thanks, Nina. That was really amazing. And thanks for everyone for uh, logging on. And maybe we'll see you next week, uh, next Thursday night. And stay safe. Jay Simple is going to be talking next week. It's going to be a good one. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity. It, it was really my pleasure. And thanks everyone for all your comments and for tuning in. Take care. Stay safe.